Hello, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to this episode of Dixon Politics. You've got me, Samantha, and Paige. <laughs> Paige, welcome to the show. This is your first time officially hosting. How does it feel to be the host of a podcast? I'm excited. I mean, I did my when I knew um, and I absolutely love that. So I'm I'm really pumped to be back here with you guys. Well, we're excited to have you. And I also really appreciate you coming on to WYSP as our director of client success to work with all of our sponsors. It'll be great for them to have a point of contact and, you know, someone they can talk to to make sure that their campaigns are successful. So Paige, you've had a very, very big month. For those of you who don't know Paige, she was the very first interviewee on our other show, When I Knew, which originally started here with Dixon Politics. We thought we were going to release it as a special edition episode. Paige's episode comes out. It got thousands of downloads all over the world in like 24 hours. And that's when we realized that it needed to become its own show. So Paige, this past month, you turned 30. Yes. Congratulations. You're old. And you also celebrated three years of sobriety. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's very exciting. It wasn't easy, but um, I keep doing it every day. You've done a fantastic job. And I also would like to add that Paige has also not had any relapses. And look, you know, everyone's journey is different. You know, some people can stay sober. Sometimes people relapse, you know, so I'm not saying that one story is better than the other. But what I can say is you are my best friend. You're my longest friend. You're my longest standing friend. And I am so proud of you. So Paige, give us a really quick run through of what we're going to be discussing today, because I know the past couple of weeks have been a little confusing for our listeners. We introduced them to five brand new guys and the guys come in and they're talking about video games and they're talking about sports. And a lot of our listeners were like, who are these guys? <laughs> and so we're going to strip it back and go back to basics. So Paige, what are we covering today? So we are going to talk about Michael Cohen um, and the trials that are going on with him and his involvement with President Trump. We are going to speak about the Kardashians and the yeah. most recent scandal. Um, <laughs> we have a little bit to talk about uh, the Beavers. And yeah. we're going to round it all out with our favorite Jacko, Michael Jackson. <laughs> and then towards the end of this episode, I think, I'm trying to remember, my schedule is so hectic. I think the It's Bro Time guys might slide into this episode. I'm not sure. But I did record the second segment for Game Over earlier this afternoon. It's really good. So stay tuned, you guys. And let's get right into it. Our political segment known as What's Burning? Um, our whole government is burning. <laughs> <laughs> our whole government. So, Paige, we had the start of the Cohen trials this past week, and you and I talked about this a lot. We thought, oh, my God, we need to go live. We need to record something now. We need to report live. And then we decided that we wanted to take a second and kind of digest it and then report about it. So why don't you walk us through what happened? So Michael Cohen is the, you know, the Trump family's former lawyer, he, he has a ton of insight into their personal lives, their legal lives, all of that. And he is now on trial and answering a lot of questions that everybody has. Um, at this point, he's linked Trump to, I think it's about 11 felonies. Lovely. Who knows if they're all true, but it's, there's something, there's, there, there's some kind of substance to them. So, mm -hmm. and it's... I mean, it's all over the place. It's with the Russian collusion. It's with sexual harassment of women. Um, Paying off women that Trump was having affairs with. It's I mean, this whole everything. thing with that, um, the sex parlor scandal. The Trump oh. just took, took a selfie with the owner of that sex parlor. Uh, yeah, we live, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a mess. Um Cohen says that, you know, there was Russian collusion. I had an idea of it, but I wasn't there for any of it. Bullshit. He has, he has things to say about Trump's infidelities, his, his use of women. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, all How of racist he is. Out. What a, right. You know, he's a con artist and this, that, and the other. You know what's interesting is... Yeah, 
and you said this to me earlier, people get scared when they get caught, you know, and they get upset when they get caught. So I'm, I'm sorry that it almost had to come to blows in this way for him to finally step forward. And say, all right, all right, all right, all right. Here, I'll give you all the details, or not all, but you know, I'll give you the details you want. I'll give you the information you want. But I wonder, I'm really big on like remorse. I think remorse is a very interesting emotion. Do you think that Cohen is remorseful at all for not the fact that he got caught? I'm sure he's very remiss about that, but do you think that he feels bad for all the awful things that he aided and abided? Or do you think that it is just like, you know, not a scratch on him. I I think he's um, coming forward because he got caught, but I also think he's coming forward because it's the right thing to do. Who knows how much of each it is, um, but it, it's bringing up things of, you know, campaign finance violations, election fraud, sexual harassment, insurance fraud, um, witness tampering, bank fraud. These are things that are coming out that w- the last time we had this kind of um, scandal with a president and this kind of disgust with a president was Tricky Nixon. Dick. It was Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> tricky Dick. <laughs> yeah. Why have I never heard that before? <laughs> yeah, that that was his nickname, Tricky Dick. And, wow. and it comes out in more tax fraud um, yeah. You know, so what's coming up next? Because there's two other people that are now being called in to testify. Well, you know, we have Trump's CFO. He's he'll be coming in and, you know, a good family friend will be coming in. We have mm-hmm. Paul Manafort, who just got 40 10 seconds. Long. Yeah. He, he'll be doing months. he'll be doing God. just under four years. Who knows how much of that time he'll actually spend in prison? We'll have to see. None um, of it. Or, right. I mean, unfortunately, white collar crimes aren't, they happen all the time, but these people who get convicted of them, they get, okay, I spent six months in prison and now I'm home on a, what, in a whatever. Mansion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to sort of stand by and watch as this unfolds. Um, you know, I'm not comfortable making any predictions. I am not a political uh, political expert, but um, <clears throat> this is going to have a really big effect on, you know, people watching and um, how they perceive and understand our justice system. And, well, and how our elections go coming up. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 that too. So, all right. You know what, though? Let's let's lighten the mood a little bit. Let's get into pop culture. So, everyone, please stick around. Join us for our next segment called Hashtag Hashtag. I don't know about you. I'm sick and tired of talking about the Kardashians, so I will make this really, really quick. So Khloe Kardashian was in a relationship with Tristan Thompson, and they had a baby together. Right as Khloe was going into labor, it was announced that Tristan had been cheating on Khloe. There was video and photographic evidence, and it was terrible. Cut to, you know, here we are. What is it, like a year or not even a year, I don't think, just a few months later. And uh, he is now being accused of cheating again, but this time it is with a close family friend. So Chloe has a sister named Kylie. Everyone knows who Kylie Jenner is. And Kylie has a friend named Jordan Woods. And Jordan and Kylie are living together. They're sort of like co-parenting her daughter um, when, you know, her husband is out of town, so on and so forth. And apparently Jordan was out with a group of her friends at um, some sort of a bar or a club or something like that. And then they, well, no, they left and then they went to a house the party house that party. was at Tristan's house. And apparently at that house party, everyone is claiming that they made out. Um, you know, there's some people that were claiming, I think, that they slept together, this, that, and the other. So what people don't know about Jordan Woods is that her father was really big in Hollywood and he actually worked on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So for her entire life, she's been very close to Will and Jada Smith. So Jada Pinkett Smith has a show called Red Table Talk, and it airs on Facebook. And Jordan came on and did an interview. So, Paige, did you have a chance to watch that interview? I I did. Um, okay. I, what do you think? I think I think Jordan is in a position where she knows she did something wrong, but I feel mm-hmm. like right now she's trying to save her ass. 
Yeah, I think there's more to the story. So she's claiming that the only thing that happened that night was she was sitting on the arm of a couch and had her legs draped across his. And then she claims that when she went to leave his house at seven o'clock in the morning, that he kissed her. I don't doubt that either of those things happened, but I 100% think on the low low, those two have been texting. I don't know if they had necessarily slept together yet. Like, I don't, I, I think it would be pretty hard for them to do so because they're both so much in the public eye and her security and his security are tied directly to Chris Jenner's security team. So I can't imagine they'd be able to get away with it, but I definitely think they have been texting and I think they had reached that like certain point, you know, when you're texting someone and you like, start to feel like, oh, maybe this could be something. Maybe you're catching feelings, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, but those conversations have happened, right? Those conversations of, I like you, you like me. I'm attracted to you. You're attracted to me. Um, could we make this work? I don't know. Let's figure out the logistics. And I think it was right at that point in their dialogue that this night happened. Would you agree with me? Yeah, I think there there was something to preface this. I think... You know, everybody says they kiss, but there was no tongue. Um, it doesn't matter. Cheating is cheating, but it doesn't just pop out of the blue. Right. I agree. So now, like, Khloe Kardashian came out with this, like, scathing tweet. And it was honestly, it was pathetic. Adriana sent a screenshot of it to me. And I'm like, dude, no, no. And it was like, oh, instead of going out publicly before talking to me, like, why don't you tell the truth at Jordan Woods? And you are the reason my family's not together. I'm like, you know what, Chloe? Sit down. Just sit down. You have a daughter. You have more than enough money and more than enough resources to just handle this behind closed doors. Like, just just sit down. You know what? Honestly, I don't even want to talk about this anymore because it's so pathetic. But you know what it I is. do want to talk about? Which is sort of like, it's weird. So... Haley and Justin Bieber recently sat down and did an interview for Vogue magazine. And it was like the most depressing interview I've ever heard. It was just, it goes to show you can have money and fame and fortune and uh, an incredible career and you can be good looking, but man, that does not convince me that you've got it all or that you're happy. So did you hear about this interview and like how negative it was? Yeah, no, I've heard about it. I haven't seen it. I, what I do know is that their relationship as a whole is bizarre. You it's see, weird. you see them on, you know, the E and Snapchat and whatever, and it's they're never close. They're oh, they're it's always, you know, captions of they look unhappy and this and that. It, it's a weird relationship. Uh, first of all, they're really young. I think Haley's like twenty two. Like they're really, really young. So. Their entire interview was basically like, yeah, we're married, but like marriage is really hard. Like, it's just yeah. hard. We really have to work on it. It's hard. Well, yeah, marriage is hard. You know what else is hard? Friendships, other relationships, working relationships, like everything is hard. But it just seemed so like I really got the feeling that they rushed into this and that uh they sort of rushed into it and then realized, oh, my God, what the hell did we just do? I thought that because we could afford these vacations, these homes, these cars, these perks, these amenities, that it would sort of be blissful. And it's not. And I think the reason it's not is because Justin's dealing with a lot of stuff. I think he's back in rehab now for his depression. Oh and boy. Um, yeah, you know, and I'm glad that he's addressing it because depression is really serious and attention must be paid. But. I don't know. I think that they rushed into it. And on top of that page, I don't know if you know this, they don't have a prenup. Yeah, that that's crazy. I think that's super crazy. They're both. Justin is worth like 250 like billion dollars or something like a million or billion. Who I don't know. I mean, it's it's insane when you get married. Um, it, it comes with a lot of things. I know this. I am a divorcee. Um, it. It. It's not easy. Sometimes getting married makes it more complicated. Yeah, I don't know. The whole thing was very, very bizarre. But speaking of bizarre, we really need to talk about the Michael Jackson documentaries. Paige, I know you have a very special nickname for Michael Jackson. Would you like to tell everyone what it is? Yeah, it's Wacko Jacko. I mean, he, he was... <laughs> he, he was he a, is a bizarre... Yeah, he was a bizarre, bizarre individual. Talented. 
but also very bizarre. So recently, Oprah Winfrey uh, produced a documentary on HBO called Leaving Neverland. It's a two-part documentary, and it follows these two now-grown men who claim to have been molested by Michael Jackson. So I watched it. I know you haven't had a chance to see it yet because you've been busy. I watched it. And I know that a lot of people are talking about it and everyone's, oh my God, yes, you know, believe the children. And yes, when children say, you know, you need to believe them, blah, blah, blah. I agree with all that. But you want to know what disturbed me more than anything was watching the parents of these boys. So one of the boys, so Wade had um, his brother come on and do some commentary, but both of the boys had their moms. And what was interesting to me is like the moms fully admitted, yeah, I knew that that my son was sleeping in the same bed as Michael. And yeah, I knew they would be in there for hours and so on and so forth. Why? Why did that not seem odd to you? He was in his 30s and your kids were like, you know, seven, six, seven years old. Why would you let your six, seven year old sleep with a 30 year old man that is not, you know, his his father? You know, like you get into bed with your parents when you're little, if you have like a nightmare or you're really, really sick. Other than that, like I wouldn't crawl into bed with my uncle. I I, I just don't understand. Like, why would that strike the moms as, oh, this is normal. And you know what else I didn't really like was the moms during their interviews, Paige, I'm not joking. They were like laughing. They were getting there. They were giggling. They were laughing. They were. You know, it was just weird. Why? Why would you let your child sleep in bed with a grown man who's not his father? I don't get that. It's our psyche. This this famous man is interested in my kids and I can bring them to this wonderful place because that's what Neverland was. It was this facade of a wonderful place. And I'm not saying this is an excuse for Michael Jackson. He had a really wrong upbringing and mm-hmm. which which directed him to the way he behaves but right there's right and wrong exactly and what happened i completely 100 percent believe that michael jackson was a pedophile but you know what's interesting about it too is there's then you have people like paris hilton and nicole richie and macaulay culkin and the osborne kids that absolutely swear up and down backwards forwards and sideways that michael never touched them so i wonder so okay so Paige, once upon a time you were majoring in psychology when someone is trying to sort of select a victim what are the things they're looking for to make the grooming process easier well well and that's what it is it's a grooming process i think with these celebrity kids that you've mentioned It's more difficult to groom someone like that. They're in the public eye as well as you. So if you have these people who are average everyday people, and you can manipulate them much more easily Mm -hmm. than somebody else who is on the same. Who's in the public eye. And who has parents that are in the public. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what are the kinds of things? And like, I know that there's really, there's so many different iterations And there's so many different nuances and it's so circumstantial when things like this do happen. But what are the characteristics that a predator looks for in a victim? Is it age? Is it, um, you know, are there certain questions they ask to get a feel for how they perceive the difference between right and wrong? Talk to me a little bit about that. So, I mean, there, there is with any, anyone who is a sexual predator, whether you're a pedophile, a rapist, whatever, you do have your preference on what you're looking for. And I think with Michael Jackson, it did. Age was definitely a factor because he liked the younger children. I think with him having that home Neverland, that was a way to, it was a cover. Draw them it in, was, Yeah. Right. It was a cover up. It was bring your kids to this wonderful place. Um, And there were a lot of kids that went in and in and out of there. And not every single one of them was a victim of molestation from him. Mm -hmm. So he did. He had a preference. And 
there are pedophiles out there who who truly believe that they're giving love to a child. And I think that might have been part of his mentality is that he was mm-hmm. providing this love for these these boys that he himself did not have growing up. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think it's very um, I think it's interesting. So, OK, so we're talking about we're looking at gender. We're looking at age. We're looking at sort of social socioeconomic status as well um i also think it comes down to gender because like you said you know pick your poison everyone has their preferences right you know you have your favorite food you have certain people you're attracted to certain jobs you're attracted to and so on and so forth um but yeah for me the most disturbing part was just watching the moms um and really getting a chance to not talk to them but listen to them speak and try to put yourself not so much in their shoes, but try to put yourself in the room with them uh, and really understand what their thought process was like. So um, it's a really, really good documentary. I think that a lot of people are having a hard time with it because we do tend to like anathemize these people. We put them on a pedestal because they're rich and they're talented. And, you know, when performers go out on stage, we think, oh, gosh, that person's so brave. I wish I could be like them. But The fact is, like you just said, right is right and wrong is wrong. And yes, Michael Jackson had an incredibly giving heart. He gave a lot of his time, his money, his platform to the organizations and the causes that he felt were most important. But I also do think that there was a side to him that was not mentally well and that that is what led him to do the terrible things that he did. Did he do them out of love? Maybe. But you also heard very clearly in the documentary that he was grooming these kids and he was grooming them to, you know, to say, oh, well, you know, if anyone ever found out about us, I would go to jail and you would go to jail. And this is normal. This is how we show love, this, that and the other. So when you're grooming someone like, you know, that it's wrong, you groom because you need to brainwash them and get them sort of, I guess, on the same page as you <laughs> like it, but it's just, it's awful. Um, I definitely recommend you, you watch the documentary though. It's, it's very, very difficult to watch, but it's good and it's very well done. And apparently the people that were in it were not paid to be in it. Um, well, and that's, so. that's unusual and amazing um, because you hear so many times that, oh, these people are coming forward because they're, they're financially benefiting from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that, like, is it easy for you? Because I know you and I loved Michael Jackson growing up. I mean, we would literally run through our homes going, hee <laughs> hee. We love oh, Michael yeah. Jackson. You know, how does it, how does it feel for you as as a fan of his and an admirer of his to hear about these allegations and then hear about them now again? Like when you do have a degree in psychology and you are thirty years old and you have you know younger cousins and um, you know young nieces and nephews. Like, how does it feel for you to experience this sort of all over again during this new phase of your life? I think um, it's it's devastating that somebody that you had a respect for who was extremely musically talented it's disheartening to know that they did these things and I think without a shadow of a doubt he did do these things Mm. have I stopped listening to his music no because his music is amazing do I have respect for him as a human being no do I have sympathy for him yeah his childhood Mm -hmm. was was messed up but you you become an adult and he used that to his advantage. And he was a sick person, but what he did, he did. And he, he ended up dying of, you know, he basically killed himself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that you say sort of separating the man from the music, like we can still love his music and love his dancing, but he, him as a person, um, I just, I, I'm struggling with it a little bit. You know, I, I loved Michael Jackson, um, but as someone who has been the victim of sexual assault, right. to know this now, it's like, forget it. So the two guys that were being interviewed are Wade Robson, who some people probably know, he was the choreographer for NSYNC and Britney Spears. He's had a hugely successful career. And the other gentleman was James Safechuck. 
So Wade is now 36 and James Safechuck is now 41. They're both married. Um, I believe they're both fathers as well. But what was interesting was when they took you through the documentary, um, the, I really liked the way the men interviewed. Um, they weren't laughing. They weren't having a good time. But they weren't also trying to convince. What was interesting about the way they presented the information was they were showing you the process. It went in chronological order. And um, they they didn't shy away from saying, you know, I was in love with Michael. I thought that I was his special friend. And um, James, at one point, like Michael took him out and bought him rings, like engagement rings. And he thought that he was going to marry Michael. And th- I really appreciated that because I, I know that this is a tremendously painful for them to revisit. But I appreciate that they really went there and they were like, you know, yes, now, like, I know what was wrong. But in the moment, I was in love with him. I felt safe with him. I right. thought that I was special to him. Um, I re- you know, I really thought, I really felt. Um, it's the whole it's again it's very very well done but you know what i think oh my goodness i wish um i wish those two uh the very best and any other victims that uh were affected by michael jackson and his completely wrong um and nonsensical and baseless decisions um i wish everyone the best and I know it's easier said than done because assault and abuse of any type, it it is something that sticks with you forever and ever and ever. So if you do know someone who has been assaulted or if you yourself have have been assaulted, um, reach out to people. There's a lot of different nonprofit organizations, uh, many of which will interact with you on a confidential basis if, um, if you don't want to disclose who you are. But talk about it because... It is something that you will have to live with, but you can live with it because, you know, great friends like you, Paige, you you keep me going when you know, having moments where I'm remembering, you know, the things that I've been through um, and you stick by my side and you let me feel those things. And then we we try to move on from them until the next time it hits me and then we we do it all over again. But it can be done. It absolutely can be done. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're both victims of it and, uh, it's hard to get through, but you can get through it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know what, in some cases, like, I, I feel like I emerged stronger. Um, you know, I think one other thing I'd like to point out is that a lot of times we hear, um, you know, we hear people say, well, why are you saying this now? Why didn't you say something back then? And what a lot of people, I think, don't understand is, especially when this happens to you when you're a young child, you don't yet have the dialogue to explain what's happened to you. And in this situation where you are being groomed as a very, very young child, you don't recognize that anything wrong is happening. It's not until you get a little bit older and you start to read the news and you know, chat with your peers that you start to sort of see the boundaries between right, wrong, acceptable, unacceptable, and so on. But up until that point, you really don't, you don't get it. Well, next up, we are going to lighten the mood a little bit. Um, We have a great segment with our guys from Game Over, our geeks, and they're totally fine with me calling that. I have permission. But Paige, congratulations on your first episode of Dixon Politics. I think you did a fantastic job. How are you feeling about it? I feel I feel great. I love doing this. I'm I'm super happy to be here to be supporting you and to be a part of this. Thank you. Oh, you're very sweet. Well, I'm excited because going forward, the main hosts of Dixon Politics are going to be myself, Samantha, Paige, Adriana, Corbin, and then Aurora, who's our UK correspondent. And I'm excited because you have some recordings coming up with her in the coming weeks. And I'm excited to get the two of you together. I think it's going to be Really nice to hear the two of you riff off one of another, one of another, one another. <laughs> um, and you're very similar. You're both very similar people. And I think it's going to be lovely. So, all right, everyone, stay tuned for our next segment. Game over. All right, boys, 
you are back for your second episode. Hello, everyone. You got me, Samantha, and I am here with two of three of the hosts of Game Over. I've got Stephen over in the UK, and I got Ian over in New England. How are you guys doing? Doing well. How are you, Samantha? I'm very good, thank you. Stephen, how is everything in the UK? Absolutely great. A little bit cold, but we're used to that. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are very used to that. So, you guys, I have to congratulate you because you premiered last week. And I think, Ian, especially, you were very, very nervous. You just thought that you were going to be way too geeky, way too nerdy, way too in the weeds. The feedback you got was the exact opposite. So how does it feel to know that there are people out there that are interested to learn about gaming and the whole world of gaming? Like, what does that feel like to you as someone who's been so immersed in this world for your, basically your entire life? Well, it's, the feeling is joy and happiness, really. It's, uh, there's an audience out there that literally wants to tune in and listen to me and Steven and will talk about this kind of stuff. It's kind of like a pipe dream. <laughs> but knowing that there's actually people out there who wants to do it, it just gives me more fuel to my fire. So uh, it took me a little bit to actually listen to our own episode. I just don't had to get over the fact that I had to listen to my own voice. But I listened to it. <laughs> I critiqued myself. A, a bunch of my friends listened to it, and they all mm-hmm. gave positive reviews. Uh, but it's funny you brought up how I sounded a little nervous in the beginning. Uh, that was mm-hmm. also brought to my attention. <laughs> yeah. And that was well, uh, it's funny, Stephen. Truth, so. I. Well, you were nervous, and Stephen, it was funny because, you know, Ian and I worked together. So the second I got the first draft of the audio from Adriana, for those of you, I know you all know Adriana. She's my co-host for Dixon Politics, and she also does all of our sound editing. And Adriana sent me the file, and I stuck the earphones in Ian's ears. He couldn't even get through the intro. He was so nervous. He threw my earbuds across my desk and was like, I can't. Uh, so, it took a little bit to get over, but I got over it. Good. I'm glad you got over it. And Stephen, we feel so lucky to have you because, like we said last week, you've worked in the gaming industry. It's been a huge part of your life for almost all of your life. And you're over there in the UK and opening us to all of you know Europe, <laughs> all of the EU. You know, I think I'm interested to see, did you get any feedback from your friend this week? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the feedback we got was, uh, you know, it's got a good energy. Uh, people liked that. There was good. a few people who said, you know, we need to be 100% on some of the, f- the things that we're saying. But that's, yep. you know, that's pretty understandable. <laughs> you know what? It's a learning curve. <laughs> when I said 13 to 14, the first message I got from one of my mates was, no, 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 it's 15. It's 15 years. WoW has been here for 15 <laughs> years. Me. Oh, like, okay. Me. Yeah. okay sorry friend for being a year off <laughs> well you know what it's good because i think it's important to be accurate because people are very passionate about gaming and the whole gaming right. world so you know what we wanted to do and we talked about this all week and this is what we always do we go back to the drawing board we talk to each other what did we like what didn't we like and i'm excited because you guys have come up with a way to really ease people into gaming and so You know, I think we all sort of lived through the 70s, through the 80s, through the 90s. Well, we weren't there during the 70s. That would make us no-no. But you know what I mean? But we watched, you know, gaming and uh, as we were growing up, and it really was something that stayed very much in the home, usually down in the basement. And now, cut to 2019, gaming has completely evolved and it's become its own world, its own universe. So I'm really excited to talk about where gaming is now. And I want to start off with talking a little bit about Twitch. And Ian, I want you to start this off because I know when I, when, Ian, when I text Ian and I don't hear back from him, it's because he's watching Twitch. So Ian, <laughs> in two sentences, can you tell us what is Twitch and how did you discover it? Oof, two sentences. All right, let's see about that. Watch people play video games randomly on the internet. That's literally how I found it. That's the two sentences from a super high level of what Twitch is. But there's a a little bit more to it and a little bit of a history behind it, actually, which I find is pretty interesting. So even before Twitch was a thing, it was considered Justin.tv. So all the people listening right now, fact check that. That's 100% fact. (laughs) 
<laughs> so it was originally, yeah, it was originally he called was Justin in TV. his shower Googling yeah. to make sure uh, that this is fact checked. It's <laughs> true. Sorry, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. So it started off as Justin.tv. And uh, Stephen, do you, were you around during those times? I actually was. In fact, before Justin TV, there was a different platform. And I'll only talk about it briefly, but I was involved in it, which was they used to do radio shows, live radio shows with IRC chats, which is like this little text uh, channel you'd have. And they did this one called Wow Radio, which I never got involved with, and another one called Nordrasil Radio, which I did get involved with. And before Justin TV existed, that's what we used to use. But out of that was born this amazing platform, Justin TV. But the problem with Justin TV was it was mostly confused about what it was. It was like 50% people doing live videos where they're just talking about really random shit. And then 50% gaming. And then they were like, do you know what? They completely rebranded out of the ashes of this phoenix that was Justin TV came out Twitch and you know, honestly, they made a great move. Twitch is. Does phenomenal. Twitch okay? Do, do the letters stand for anything, or is it just one word, just Twitch? And Twitch is an, an entity, a thing. That's... Second one, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you can ask okay. them if there's a, a history behind the Twitch, Twitch. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I'm sure they're going to be just. Yeah, I don't think it's drooling. like T doesn't stand. Yeah, T doesn't stand for something. W doesn't. It's just Twitch, and it's dot TV too. You got to be sure that it's not dot com. It's not dot org. It's dot TV. Okay, is so this is something prominent. that people. I understand that people use their laptops and their computers. Is this something you can also tune into on your phone? Yes, absolutely. Oh my god! All right, you can watch, and you this can watch is a global thing. Go. Yeah, it's a, that's the oh, yeah. extremely interesting thing. And that's why I was actually excited to get this episode recorded because I wanted to pick Steven's brain. I know about Twitch over here in the uh, United States. I wanted to see, is it as prevalent or even more in the UK? It's essential actually here. If, if you're talking about gaming culture, most people here will watch Twitch. So they'll watch other people gaming whilst they game. Wow. Uh, it could be, for example, League of Legends. If I look at Twitch right now, League of Legends got 255,000 people viewing that game right now. Jeez Louise. Uh, and so uh, this sort of... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you've got everything from people just playing the game, but also there's people instructing people how to play. So some people ah, okay. play at the same time because they want to learn, for example, how to be better at a certain role within the game. So it's... That's it's, cool. Yeah. Like it's not that. just watching people play. There's a lot more Absolutely. Than that. There's even well, a section literally called just chatting, and that could be somebody <laughs> sitting in front of their screen interacting with what they say is chat. And what chat essentially is is when you're watching somebody stream on Twitch, there's a little chat section over to the corner where people who are watching can interact with one another and talk. So literally it's them in front of a screen talking to people texting him. And I there's can't. thousands of people watching people do this. Uh, so, and it's not even them just talking. There's like I was watching one the other day too. She was like making pottery or something like that. Well, so, Ian yeah. – Ian, so Adriana sent me that video this week oh, down on Twitter of this girl who just had really big boobs and huh? oh, she yeah. was just standing there jumping up and down and she sends it to me and she goes, when Ian doesn't text you back, it's because he's watching this. I'm like, ooh, where's the lie? No. Where's uh, the lie? I don't um, sub to okay. those channels, but there, there so, are people like that. Okay. All right. You know what, Ian? Whatever helps you sleep at night, right? I, I love you to bits. Whatever helps you sleep. So into streaming. That's another word that we hear all the time, and we know what streaming is. But what is it specifically like for gaming? Is there um, – are there, like, different channels? Are there different categories? Like, is it all sort of just like a free-for-all? Is it sort of like – so I guess how what I'm trying to say is – is Twitch sort of like YouTube or is it sort of like Google where you can go in and you can say what you want to watch and it'll take you to like 50,000 different options and you pick on the one that you like? How does yes. it work? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so you can essentially stream anything so long as you have the copyright permission, which most games, they're never going to say no because unless the game's not been released, it's free PR, right? Mm -hmm. um, but... At the same time, you won't find everything. So sometimes you'll search and there might not be anyone playing that game because it's not a game that suits streaming. Because to stream, okay. you need a game that you can talk over. So it can't be too dialogue heavy. It can't be too story driven. 
it needs to be something where there's long patches where you can interact with the viewers and there's a lot mm-hmm. of interaction a lot of competition a lot of uh giveaways free stuff from in game free hmm. you know gift cards you name it holy okay this is you know it's so let me just tie this back a little bit for the ladies i think for those of you who have facebook you probably noticed especially in 2018 and it's still very relevant now you go on facebook you're just trying to relax who's getting engaged who's gone on vacation but you were getting slapped in the face with all these different people primarily women who were live streaming i did it last year i worked for a company that sold jewelry that that sold wow goodbye (laughs) yeah grammar for me one time I know. <laughs> Thanks, babe. So I uh, I worked for a company that sold jewelry online, and the way that I did it was I would go live on Facebook, and my numbers would be crazy. Like, I'd finish streaming, and I would have, like, 15,000 views on my video, and I could see the analytics, and I could see where people were tuning in from, and it was I, – I only streamed myself in the U.S., and the fact that I could hit those numbers in the U.S. was crazy to me. So – Let's talk a little bit about, like, we know why people watch, right? Like, if we dial it back and we talk about psychology, like, humans are naturally social curious creatures. That's why we've been able to evolve and why we're now, you know, I don't know, a thriving species, well, some would argue, but a thriving (laughs) species. But, like, let's really talk about that culture. Steven, for you, as someone who's worked in the industry, why do you think people are so interested in watching other people play games? Do you think that it's social? Do you think it's camaraderie? Do you think it's um, just connecting with people outside of their own orbit? What is it for you? I, I think it's a combination between the entertainment factor and the social factor. So people are coming there because these days, unlike previous generations where you know, you'd want to focus on one thing entirely with your energy. More and more people are multitasking, but not in a traditional sense. They're not like, you mm-hmm. know, cleaning the floor whilst doing their calculus. Instead, now, they're, they're playing <laughs> they're a not? game and streaming <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. And and they'll do that. I actually do this all the time. I watch a, a game, I play a game, and I talk to my friends at the same time. Oh, jeez. And your wife. <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> Don't forget about that. <laughs> You do it all at once. So Ian, as someone, and, and forgive me, E, and you say this about yourself, so you can't get mad at me. Ian, by the way, for those of you who don't That's follow a loaded like, question. the guys, so <laughs> you, you need, first of all, uh, you can follow these hosts on Instagram. Um, Ian is at Ian from Game Over. Uh, Steven is at Burn Gaming, so B-E-R-N Gaming. But, you know, Ian, now in 2019, Six feet Correct. tall, you're thin, you're gorgeous. But Correct. once upon a time, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but once upon a time, you were sort of this this lanky, awkward, anxious, younger kid. So when you first got into gaming, and this was before streaming, like what was it about gaming that really spoke to you and found its way, for lack of a better term, into your heart? And then how has that carried now into adulthood? That actually is a great question. And actually, I, gaming is a big part of my life. And I know exactly the point and the game I was playing when it became just not just uh, sitting around playing PlayStation with your buddies, but it was strictly playing PC gaming in around uh, middle school and high school. And I remember, I'm sure Steven knows about this. There was a thing called X-Fire, which was this uh, yeah, yeah. chat system. And we would play Call of Duty 2 on the PC. And not only that, it's like I would interact with these people using – we're actually now – shout out Discord. We're recording right now using Discord. But back in the day, there was something called Ventrilo. So not only was I able to play with these people online because that was a major changing point too. When you were – like mm-hmm. everything was mm. typically – when you wanted to game with somebody, you had to go over to your buddy's house and sit in his basement and sit right next to him and play. Once the prevalence of online gaming came out, that's when everything went different. So, so I was playing gaming Duty, like yep. – is it like something that you like look forward to? Is it almost like a comfort to you? Like, God, I had such a shitty day at work and I'm stressed out. I can't wait to go home and yeah. get online. Like, is that sort of how you Absolutely. associate? 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Like some people, everybody to de stress, they have their own little things. People get off work, they have a stressful day, pour himself a glass of wine. How many people do that? Millions. Me. Some people have a <laughs> stressful day, they get home, and what relaxes them is just putting their feet up on the couch, throwing on PlayStation, and just game it a little bit. That's Putting on cool. a headset, uh, maybe being able to interact with your friends that you're unfortunate no longer to live close by, like Steven, all the exactly, way across yeah. the Atlantic Ocean. We're talking to him like he's literally right in front of us. And, and you're able to do this. Thing, right? I mean, yeah. I have so many friends in the US, and the only time we ever talk is online when we're gaming. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've got, I've got a friend uh, in Estonia, and uh, shout out to Ralph. And, um, <laughs> Hi, Ralph! And, <laughs> shout out, Ralph. <laughs> and this is the thing, right? When you talk to your games after a bad, when you talk to your friends, sorry, after a bad day in your game, you don't just play the game and forget about life. Sometimes you literally just complain about your day to them. They're literally <laughs> like mm -hmm. an agony aunt service, but it's got gaming as well. It's that's fun. really nice yeah. though. And, you know, and, I, and I know that there's a lot of female gamers, so I don't, I don't want to sure. pigeonhole oh, yeah. and say, oh, this is just guys, this is just guys. But what I really admire about the gaming industry is because it is predominantly male. I think I can say that. And I've always been really fascinated by male friendships. I think that, you know, for women who are naturally, you know, a little bit sensitive and caring because that's just the way that society shapes us, it sometimes can be easier for us to, you know, make friends. But I think that male friendships are a little bit more complicated than that. And they're a little bit more complex because bonding with another guy really does kind of go against um evolution uh in a sense you know it's it's always sort of every man for himself hunter gatherer that sort of mentality but what i love about the gaming community is that it is a place for you guys to all come together and yeah you're gaming and you've got you know that character ian that you posted on instagram i was talking to will over dinner last night and i said well what is it that's coming out of that that man's arms and he goes oh blade <laughs> and I was like, oh nice that okay. was Baraka. Like, Shout out Baraka. <laughs> and he's got, you know, 500 teeth. But what I really like is that, yeah, you know, you're running around and you're stabbing people and you're shooting at things and, and whatnot. But it does sort of act as a little bit of a buffer for you guys to talk about your day or to, you know, hey, how's your family doing? And I think that there's something really lovely about that equation. And I'm glad that you guys have found that space. So while we're on the, the topic, and I realize see, this is my problem. This is why... I have another podcast called When I Knew, which is all human interest pieces. No this is why I wanted to have this. Shut up. This is why I wanted that podcast because I'm very interested in psychology and whatever and NLP, all that kind of stuff. But let's talk a little bit about the stigma that's associated with gamers. I think it is starting to go away because now you have all these, you know, pro athletes and rappers and yep. celebrities that are like, fuck yeah, I play Call of Duty every day. But let's talk a little <laughs> bit about the stigma because you guys are both involved in this world and involved in this community while that stigma was very strong. So let's, Ian, how would you describe that stigma? And then how did it make you feel? Because I think there's a lot of young kids that listen. That I know that the 10-year-old the demographic is really, <laughs> really into this. That's where we tested the best, actually. I, I didn't tell yeah, you that. They're the meanest that. ones on Fortnite, by the way. Those Man, I'll girls. tell you that. The, but the 10 oh, to 17, the, the little guys, 10 to 17, were like eating game over up. So what would you say to those kids that maybe, you know, yeah, it's becoming cool now, but maybe they do feel that they have a little bit of a stigma around them. You know, if you could say something to those kids or if you could say right. something to your 13-year-old self, what would it be? Just don't don't think like it's uh, something you got to hide. It's like uh, that's what I like growing up uh, like with gaming, Call of Duty specifically with like my PC gaming and things like that with Call of Duty. Like I played it competitively <laughs> in high school mm -hmm. online with a, a bunch of people that I literally never met before in my life. I met them by playing Call of Duty online mm -hmm. and we would literally talk to them like I've known them my entire life and actually made some good friendships through that. So, um, and then it's also interesting. I don't want to keep beating a, a dead horse talking about World of Warcraft, but that was literally like taboo growing up. Oh, yeah. You play, I play, you play WoW, you're automatically deemed nerd. Like, who plays World of Warcraft? So, I mean, me growing up, younger 13 year old Ian, or growing up in middle school, high school, is I didn't really dwell on the fact that people didn't really want to care to talk to me about video games. I just kept it to myself and really didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't something that uh, maybe my friends or people weren't as into it as I was. And it's just something that we didn't talk about. This is something that so I did. I guess, uh, yeah. But, uh, okay. So you're dancing around the question. So like we do in real life, Ian, 
answer it for you. I think what Ian is trying to say is, you know, this is a way to connect with people. This is a way to <laughs> find common ground and blow off a little bit of steam. And even though it might seem a little geeky or people might not be able to wrap their head around it, see the value in it, whatever, keep at it because the connections that you make through gaming – um, you know, not only getting to talk to people all around the world, but also that sense of achievement. You know, when you win those battles, you reach those next levels, that can really sort of build your confidence. Um, and I think that's really Absolutely. important. So, Stephen, what about you? Because, you know, you're just the cutest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And you have this beautiful little baby face, you know, but inside that brain, you are easily one of the most brilliant people I know. And I'm not just saying that. Um so for you, when you were growing up, and it sounds to me like you had a lot of friends around you that sort of liked what you liked. Oh, yeah. But how did that stigma make you and your friends feel? And what would you say to your 13-year-old self? I'd say, do you know what? Everything's going to be all right. Honestly, the, the thing is, when you're that age and people have got a negative feeling about something that you're into, because I was double stigma Yeah, I was into gaming, but I was also into music. And I sang in the choir. <laughs> I sang in the... <laughs> Don't worry, Stephen. I was a, I band, was so. a music nerd as well as a gaming nerd, so I had a double hammer there. But um, nice. But the, here's the thing, right? I met my best man through through WoW, uh, and I bet I I met two ex girlfriends through WoW. We say WoW is the friend making game, and the reason mm-hmm. why is because it was the first hugely social game that was a massive success that encouraged you to communicate and work as a team. It wasn't like, That's actually... yeah, it wasn't like you were solo playing or free for all or do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. That's a, that's actually a greatly point. Yeah, I'm thinking about wow, how many people you meet because literally you can't be playing for all those hours. You're playing for all those hours not because you're so addicted to the game. It's just you're so addicted to not addicted. I don't like using that word, but uh, you're just, it's not just the gaming aspect. It's the social aspect. You're not yeah, playing yeah. for six hours. By yourself, you're playing. It's literally you're hanging out with your buddies for six hours. Yeah. You just happen to be well, playing. Well, now, I mean, I'd like to take. I, so, as someone who's friends with both of you from like a third party outsider, you know, look at you guys now. You know, Ian, yeah. you have a cool job at a great company, and you're building something with uh, with them and over there that's going to be really valuable. Not only now and going forward, you've got a great group of friends. You've got a good relationship with your family, your brother especially. Like, you're, you know, I've already complimented your physical appearance. Everyone knows you're very good looking. You know, so he turned out all right. And then, Stephen, you have a beautiful wife and a great home. You have a baby on the way. Um, You have a really interesting career and a very unique set of skills and both of you, the way that you sort of view the world, I think, is also adds a lot of value to what you bring to the table. So, yeah, you know, to all the, the kids out there, they're maybe a little bit socially awkward or, you know, they geek out about this stuff. And if they were to talk about it, someone might look at them like, ew, what a loser. Guys, kids, don't worry about it because you know what? You're going to meet friends it's going to be a lot of fun and everything's going to turn out just fine. You will not live in your mom's basement, so to speak, as the cliche goes forever sure. and ever. So here's what we can look forward to uh, for game over. And I know that I said this earlier with the it's bro time segment, but um, you know, I think that the whole point of all of our shows at WYSP is to really make everyone feel and make it very clear that everyone is part of the conversation. You know, this week we talked about Twitch and streaming. um, And then next week, we're going to be exploring some other things, some other games. We might go, you know, by company and manufacturer or by genre, but we're going to do everything we can to introduce you to this world so that when you hear other people talking about it, uh, you'll be able to include yourself in the conversation. And, you know, guys, I got to tell you that, For the longest time, I pushed so hard against Star Wars and the Marvel movie franchise. I pushed. I just wanted (laughs) nothing to do. And I think the reason for that was because I felt like I just wouldn't get it. I felt like I wouldn't be able to relate. Boy, was I wrong. The point is this. Once I actually got into Star Wars and once I got into Marvel, I have such an in with the IT guys and the computer programmers, and the software developers. You know, here we are at company outings, and, you know, those are the guys that sort of keep to each other. 
I love that I can go over to them now and say things about video games or say things about these franchises. Like, and it just, again, in the whole vein of, of gaming and why you guys love it and why you do it, not only does it unite you, but it allows someone like me, some, you know, prissy, you know, preppy, whatever I am, um, who probably <laughs> doesn't seem like someone who would have any in that world, I do. And I think it's really cool that I can finally talk about it. I might not be an expert. I might not be completely involved in it, but it means a lot that I can talk about it and I can relate to other people. You know, that's what you guys do in your community. And that's what I want to do with you. So I want to thank both of you for being so passionate about this show and about this project. And we do have a couple of announcements for you. So Ian, why don't you kick us off with the first announcement of not what, but who is to come on Game Over in the future? I am very excited about this one. It's Are you going tickled? back. I would say yes, I'm tickled. He's going to slide in perfectly giggity with this group of people. Uh, but I'm super happy about this because I've known this guy for, I let's see, just about as long as WoW's been around. 15 years wow. I've known him. And his name is Kirk. And he's uh, I've known him for 15 years all the way back from home. I grew up with him. He was actually my roommate in college for four years. Uh, and currently right now he lives a couple blocks down uh, the street. So I'm very pumped to announce that he's joining the Game Over team. So uh, on the upcoming episodes, don't uh, be alarmed when you hear a new third. <laughs> when you hear it, <laughs> when you so, uh, it. Yeah. yeah, we're very excited. We're really proud to welcome Kirk. Um, he's got a really cool job. He works in marketing and branding, um, you know, in the corporate sort of CPG world in a very niche industry. And um, so not only does he bring a lot of, value and a lot of good ideas but he is such a nice guy and he wrote me the nicest email when he accepted my offer to join the company and i'm thrilled so <laughs> while we have some momentum um i guess we can officially announce that game over is going to become its own show and we're trying to figure out the timing right now um we're probably going to launch you guys in what what will we say like mid-april Early May, give or take, yeah. something like that. You know, because I want to keep I want to keep you under my my Dixon politics umbrella just a little bit longer. But for all the people that really like the game over, guys, you can head over there. You can have those high level conversations. You can get into the weeds. Um, yeah. We can really get into it. But before they leave, we are going to, like I said before, walk you through the different segments, walk you through the industry, walk you through all the different companies and all the different key players and celebrities, so that you always sort of know, <clears throat> so that you'll know what's going on before they launch their own show. But the Game Over Voice will still be a part of Dixon Politics. Every now and again, they will pop in if there's a new game release or if there's a big tournament happening, they will pop in. They'll tell you guys what's up. Um, and I'm really, really excited. So Steven, as someone who's just been obsessed with gaming forever, I know I keep saying that, but it's I, I think of you and I think of gaming. <laughs> what does this opportunity mean to you to be able to have your own podcast with these three other guys that you've never met before in your life, but you have everything in common? What are you most looking forward to? What does this mean to you? I think this is, it means a lot, actually. It's going to be a really great chance for us to talk about a lot, a lot more than just what we've covered now. Like the wonderful thing about gaming is there's always more information. Like it, we've just skimmed the surface of a few topics there is so much to talk about. There's so many things always changing. There's so much new stuff coming out. Like, it's just going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. And I'm excited I mean, because we're opening it up to the whole world. I mean, this is not just going to be the U.S. and the U.K. There's people from all over the world that are going to get involved. Um, and I something that we discussed from the beginning, and it's still something that we're developing and building out, but... With Game Over, we really wanted to break down that fourth wall for our listeners. We wanted you guys to, you know, not only follow the guys on social media, but like, you know, hang out, play games together, um, you know, team up for tournaments, whatever it may be. We want, um, and this is something that Ian and uh, Steven were particularly passionate about. They really wanted Game Over to be interactive because that's what the whole industry is about. So, I'm so proud to be able to to support you guys in this and, and push this out and produce it. And I appreciate you letting me be <laughs> be a part of it. I know I'm like the annoying little sister that everyone's like, can you go away? But I just, 
I, I adore you and I just want to be there for the ride. So <laughs> I appreciate you letting me hang out. So, all right, let's wrap up this episode, you guys. Seeing as you closed the last episode, let's have you close out this one. You know what to do, right? Are you ready? Me? You both know what to do. All right. Yeah, I don't know what you to know do. this. <laughs> you know what? this. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning into Dixon Politics. Thank you for sticking around for Paige's first episode. Thank you for listening to It's Bro Time. And thank you for sticking around for Game Over. I am Samantha. I am Ian. I'm Steven. And you have just listened to <laughs> what's the Dicks. name of your segment? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, oh game God. Over. This, I, this is like so it's like, uh, What is that? I wish you could see me. I'm standing <laughs> in the middle of my living room. Pointing my finger at a chair. I just think, as if you're there, <laughs> you can see me. It sounded so cliche. I'm Samantha, and I'm Ian. No, you you were and Samantha I'm last Steven. week. Ian, I don't. That was a whole shit show. Week. I'm not doing that again. I put my foot down. I'm never gonna. I'm not try asking to you to. Else. Oh my god, <laughs> Samantha. This is Ian. That's Stephen. We're coming to you from New York City and the UK. Thank you very much for tuning in. You have just listened to Game Over. It's bro time and a bunch of other shit on dicks and politics. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dicks and Politics. Digestible and unfiltered content about men, money, and moments. New episodes every Wednesday. Don't forget to subscribe.